He just started birding nine years ago. Um, but uh, he's been very active in birding both in the United States and abroad. And tonight he's going to talk to us about uh, birding in uh, Sweden and migration at Foster Road. Do you have to play the PowerPoint? Hit the play. What? Hit the play on PowerPoint. Yeah, so my name is Eric, and I'm a family doc uh, from Holland, Michigan. I've been birding um, uh, nine years. This will be my tenth year on eBird, so I consider myself kind of a new birder, but I've kind of got the bug. It's uh, <laughs> been 31 days since my last tour, and it's 80 days to my next bird tour. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I like bird travel, and um, I wish I had more time to do it. Um, I started birding after I bumped into Tom Hendrickson, uh, a Holland birder that's since passed. Uh, I was in Stu Visser just walking after I had some neck surgery and here's Tom Hendrickson bundled up in a big green parka, big uh, Leica green vinyls around his neck and she said, what are you looking at? And I said, I'm looking at these uh, ruby crown kinglets. And he handed me his binocular and I saw this ruby crown kinglet I said, I can carry some binoculars around as I'm walking, so I started doing that. And then I uh, started walking slower and looking more at birds, <laughs> as the case may be. So uh, that's kind of how that started. And um, this is kind of, you know, birding is something you do when you go someplace um, as an incidental thing. You can go there, go, go place to bird specifically, but you can bird while you're there for some other reason. And I've been traveling uh, to Europe um, since I was a young boy. I have quite a bit of extended family in Sweden. Um, so I've seen Sweden and Scandinavia. And our trips have always involved sightseeing, um, seeing the, the major towns and, and sites to see there. Um, in Stockholm, you have Gamlestein, Wisconsin, and the Vasa ship, and places you may have heard of. But I've never really enjoyed, I'll say, the nature of Scandinavia as much as I've traveled there. It's always been about, you know, seeing family and doing genealogy and seeing the sites. So as I've been birding, I wanted to get back to Scandinavia and start to see uh, some nature. Um, and that was the purpose of this uh, recent trip we took in September. So this will be a bit of a travelogue, uh, but also an introduction to some of the birds of Sweden you see in fall as they migrate. So if we want to get to Sweden, we've got to get on a plane. This is a regional jet. We get on a regional jet and out of Grand Rapids and fly by Holland and Lake Megatawa, get a nice view of that area. Land in Chicago and we're scheduled on an SAS flight to uh, Copenhagen. That doesn't look like an SAS plane though. This is a uh, wet lease charter that, that uh, SAS is, is uh, leased 
because they are bankrupt and uh, can't uh, maintain enough planes to fly us all where we have to go. Um, but, you know, it's comfortable enough. And uh, the plane is actually a former South African Airbus. Um, but I think the rule of birding is you got to take care of your non-birding spouse. <laughs> so uh, she looks pretty happy in her, in, her, in her seat here. Our flight takes off from Chicago and heads to Copenhagen. We're going to fly over the uh, southern tip of Greenland and underneath uh, Iceland and into, uh, into Copenhagen there. A lot of planes that fly here. Uh, this is flight radar 24, so you get a perspective of where you are in the midst of the transatlantic travel. We're headed to Copenhagen, Denmark. We're, we're crossing to southern Sweden. We're going to spend most of our time in the very southern eighth of Sweden um, on this trip. Um, most of the people who live in Sweden live in the bottom quarter, but uh, we're going to spend our time in the southern eighth of that area. But Denmark's conveniently located. There's a bridge that I can take right across um, the Orison Strait, right into southern Sweden, and that's convenient to us. As you come into Copenhagen, descending from the north, you fly over the Orison Strait. This is a body of water between Sweden and Denmark. Um, at the bottom of that, there's the Orison Bridge, which you can take uh, from Denmark, Copenhagen, Denmark, into Malmo, Sweden. Uh, Sweden here is on the left. And you can see the bridge that they've constructed here. There's a nice view of the bridge. Uh, there's some distant wind turbines on the right. And there's a peninsula that juts out here to the, to the left, uh, from, the, from the left to the right. That's the peninsula that we will be birding on uh, at the end of this tour, or at the, the second week of this tour. As you continue to fly toward the airport, uh, you fly over an island here. This island is called Saltholm, um, or Salt Island. Um, this is a 16 square kilometer island. It's um, basically a bird habitat sanctuary, uh, limited access, restricted access. Um, it's the largest breeding colony of eiders. There'll be uh, 15,000 eiders uh, on this island, along with uh, numerous uh, juvenile swans and over 7,000 geese, 10 to 12,000 other ducks that uh, occupy this island. So a real big uh, birding habitat. further view of the end of that island, Salt Home. You can see that the bridge has a, an island that they've made as part of that bridge. Um, the bridge terminates in a man-made island, and uh, the road and the train that travels on the bridge ducks into a tunnel and continues its way over to uh, uh, Copenhagen. So the left is the tip of Salt Home. The name of the small island is called Pepper Home. <laughs> so somebody had a sense of humor there. Um, Holm in Danish means islet, like small island. The island uh, Pepperholm was constructed to have this crossover point. Um, the tunnel was built because a bridge spanning the entire distance just seemed too, too much and it would interfere with the air traffic from Castrop Airport, uh, Copenhagen's airport. Um, the tunnel and bridge sums to be about five miles long, so it's actually about this, the length of our Mackinac Bridge. And it takes about 10 minutes to traverse the uh, tunnel and bridge. Maybe a little faster in the, uh, in the train. The bridge was completed in the year 2000. The tunnel allows uh, ships larger than the bridge can accommodate to pass over the tunnel, as you see here. Um, the birding when we land at the airport starts right away on any good bird tour. Yeah. Uh, we had um, uh, European kestrels uh, right next to the runway, you know, flitting up in the air. And as we went uh, out here into southern Sweden, there were thousands of cormorants, uh, great cormorants, on the edge of this uh, uh, little island, as well as some uh, blackback gulls. Um, and some mute swans and herring gulls uh, flying about. So we were picked up in Copenhagen by uh, my third cousin, a family that I've actually known since I've been about five, so over 50 years. Um, she was a nanny to, my, uh, to our family when I was a little kid. She came over as a teenager to um, be a nanny and learn English, as many of these Scandinavian people do. And um, we've been connected to them for a long time. 
they come visit us, we go visit them, and this is one of those times we visit them. <coughs> We're about five hours uh, north along uh, the lower part of Sweden here, up to this uh, long, skinny lake, Lake Vatern, and they live up by that little red dot up there in a town called Mota. So their home is along this Lake Vatern, and um, they live in a, uh, the home on the right, and we're staying in their guest house on the left. Uh, real comfortable place. Uh, we have our own you know, pair of beds in a European fashion. They always have bird beds <coughs> that are separate, I think. And um, the cottage is really a uh, IKEA tiny home, if you will, but has everything you want. Uh, coffee for breakfast, a bottle of wine for the evening. You know, what more do you need? A nice view of the outside coming in. In the morning, we would get up and uh, start your caffeinated beverage or whatever, and I'd stand on the porch, and it was pretty evident that migration was already at hand. There were birds just flitting through the morning, the first hour or two of the morning from the <coughs> north to the south, passing through the gardens and trees right along the edge of this lake here. And you could stand there with your binoculars, uh, turn on your Merlin bird ID, and uh, try to identify as many of these birds in flight and uh, as they uh, move along. The, uh, we had a few excursions with our family uh, that were specifically uh, to look for birds. And the map here shows uh, the area that we'll be at. The heart on the upper right is where we're staying. We're going to be going to a a lake um, down here. We're going to be going to an island here, and we're going to visit these lakes up here for some bird sites. <coughs> what about that monster nest? Monster? What do you say? There's a, it says monster nest. Yeah. I think any big lake's got a monster nest. <laughs> yeah. The first place we went to was a, a nature center, uh, Naturum Token. Uh, this is a uh, really big lake uh, right along the bigger lake, but it's a significant, uh, um, they say it's one of the most important bird lakes in Northern Europe. 130 uh, bird species on the lake breeding there, and then thousands of geese and ducks will stage there in the spring and fall as they, as they come and go. It's a shallow lake, so they can, they can paddle around and dive and, and feed as they, as they uh, migrate uh, through the area. The uh, nature center has a, is, they have a really large lake <coughs> center there that we visited, and they have a number of birding towers around the lake, which make it really uh, you know, nice to bird because you can really see great distances and get the birds. This is my uh, cousin, uh, Christine, and uh, we're at that nature center walking in. I didn't take pictures of the locals that were there, but we probably were among a few hundred people that were there birding that day. It was a pretty popular place to be. This is one of their birding towers, a really robust structure, uh, concrete and wood and steel. I mean, just made to last forever. Um, and this lake is just peppered with uh, rafts of birds and geese, um, as far as you can see. Um, it really is all of our spotting scope game. And many of the venues we had on this trip were, were that. Um, I have my spider scope, my uh, uh, cousins have theirs, and didn't afford, I got a lot of bird pictures up close, uh, but it, it was still a, a spectacle to see as many migration spots are. The Nature Center uh, posts a recent bird count, and uh, you know some of these birds are familiar to what we might see here in West Michigan, and some are definitely, you know, strictly European uh, birds. Um, mute swans, Canada geese, uh, gray lag geese, mallards, gadwall, greenland teal, European widgeon, northern pintail, uh, northern shoveler, common pochard, tufted duck, common golden eye, Eurasian coots, common golden eye, among others. Pictures here show uh, some of those birds. We have uh, um, the Eurasian widgeon on the left here, and the common pochard, not, not a redhead. This one's got a red eye here. 
and then the tufted duck uh, here, which we've had one in Allegan, I believe, in the past. Also, we have great crested green, <coughs> green heron, cousin of our great blue heron, and then the Eurasian coot. I'll pick up some of the other birds we saw later in this show. We drove around from the uh, nature center around different parts of the uh, lake there, came across a uh, Eurasian kestrel that had just made a successful hunt <coughs> here on the ground uh, with its prey. There were other raptors around and on a cut grain field we had a female western marsh harrier, also with prey on the ground eating at it pretty viciously. Um, this is a bulky harrier, uh, not as graceful as our northern harrier, but uh, still an efficient hunter. And uh, uh, the female is pretty much brown with this uh, creamy gray or creamy yellow cap. Uh, the male will look uh, gray in the shoulders. Uh, we actually encountered three species of harrier during our two weeks, and I'll show you the other ones in a moment. On a bale of straw, we came across a northern weeder. I looked hard in Iceland for this and it took a long time to get one. And here we just stumbled across one in a field and on, on a big bale of hay. So, not a lifer, but was still happy to see it. After a really cold morning of birding, we went to a small town restaurant. Uh, the sign says mat, mat means food in Swedish, uh, kind of like eat here. And uh, uh, as you might expect, they serve a huge smorgasbord of food. This was a really robust uh, uh, buffet of food. We had uh, pork tenderloin, uh, dill salmon, lasagna, potatoes three different ways. Around the corner there's a huge salad bar, and uh, it was definitely more than you need. Nearby to that town, we came across a really large rune stone. The Vikings are uh, known for these large stones which they uh, record events on. Uh, this one in particular is, uh, records the story of a father's uh, grieving the loss of his son and the story about his son. Uh, on both sides, it's etched this way. I think the coloring has come uh, recently. Thankfully, the afternoon warmed up. We got rid of our coats and we went back to uh, some lakes nearby this nature center and, and spotted some more. But again, mostly a spotting scope game. And uh, more bird towers uh, all the way around the lake as we, as we went. The next venue we went to was a different day. We went to this island in the middle of Lake Vatern. Um, the, the island's called Visingo and um, it's known as a previous uh, site of the Swedish uh, royalty. They used to have a castle on the south end of the island around the 12th century. You get there, of course, by uh, ferry. Waiting for the ferry in the cold was, was pretty brutal, but I stood out on the front of the ferry just to have my little mini pelagic, you know, just count the birds as we go. Um, on the island, there's a bit of a mud flat and a pond that attracts some birds. Um, and there's an important sign you need to recognize if you have a bird in Sweden. Fogel means bird and torn means tower, so if you see Fogel torn, that's a bird tower. You better check it out. <laughs> the bird tower there looks like this. When we were there, it was uh, gray, overcast, and misty, and really cold. Uh, we spent most of our time under the tower to get out of the rain. Um, again, it was a spotting scope game. Uh, my cousins uh, and Linda didn't uh, stay too long in the uh, outdoors. We were back in the car pretty quick, I think. But there's birds to be seen. Uh, we see here uh, some Canada geese mm -hmm. in this area. We've got some gray leg geese. There's some shorebirds we'll zoom in on. And some barnacle geese over here. Mm -hmm. And the spotting continued beyond this island and, and up that hill where we saw some other birds too, but it was hard to picture them because even this is a blown up picture itself. The shorebirds were some dunlin, so we have some dunlin here. You got that beak that comes down a little bit, little black in the belly, losing its breeding plumage. <coughs> got some black bellied plovers here, another dunlin. And then this is a larger bird. 
with his head in the mud. And that's a bar-tailed godwit. There's a duck here, and that happens to be a green-winged teal. And there's a blurry bird up here we call a blurred. <laughs> what you call that? Um, I didn't notice this at the time of the, uh, of the that was on my scope, and at the I just snapped a picture just to get, look at it later, kind of thing, as, as we often do. And I went back and saw this. I thought, that's a big, rufous, stout chested bird. What is that bird? And that's a ruff. Oh, okay. So it, I added it to the list later, of course. And, but. Um, there was a Swedish couple there, and they had mentioned they had seen a ruff, and I just didn't see it. Um, of course, I had to translate what they said first. Ruff in Swedish is Bruchain, and then I have to convert that over and figure it out. So I was trying to see what they saw, but uh, that was the one bird I didn't get right away. Here's a picture of that, um, the uh, bar-tailed uh, godwit. This is a long-distance migrant. It's about to leave... Uh, uh, Scandinavia and head down to the south of uh, Africa or, or Eurasia. Uh, it's going to fly a long way. The bird that I was most happy to pick up there was, was so distant I couldn't picture it and I couldn't get back on it after I lost it, but there was a Eurasian dotterel there, uh, which is a pretty hard bird to get unless you're up north in the spring uh, where it's on territory. Um, my bird had this uh, kind of, you know, orangish chest and that white eye line, but it wasn't quite as boldly uh, marked as this breeding plumage bird here. As we left this um, uh, marshy area, or this, this muddy area, we came across a, a, a white-tailed eagle, a little similar to our bald eagle, but not uh, so bold in the head, just the white tail. Big bird. South end of this island, as I mentioned, there's the old castle. Uh, so Sweden's royal castle, the first one that they had in the mid 12th century, as uh, Sweden as a country was sort of defining itself uh, um, at the time. And these would be the remnants of that old castle here. Of course, the island was important to the Vikings before the kings started to establish themselves. And these are old Viking burial mounds uh, in a field here where these trees are growing up. The island afforded a number of um, other birds, and among them was all the corvids. So here is a uh, um, hooded crow, large crow, probably slightly bigger than our crow, and uh, gray and black in its color. And then the European jackdaw, kind of looks like a crow, but a little more compact, similar coloring. And then a big crow called a rook. It has a bear patch on its neck. That's how you distinguish it pretty reliably. Uh, rook. And these birds, these 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 corvids were <coughs> anywhere you had farmland, you saw them pretty readily. We also had um, the uh, Eurasian magpie. Uh, not that that's what we saw it that day. This is not from that day. That picture, but. Uh, they were in the farm fields as well, pretty commonly uh, feeding and so forth. The other corvid we saw on this trip was raven, but I don't have any pictures of that uh, in this show. The other possible corvid we could have seen would have been the nutcracker, Eurasian nutcracker, but we did not see that on this trip. We, we, we saw the magpies in, when we were in Finland. Yeah. So. yeah. The, the corvids were pretty much prevalent everywhere. You would go to the cities and they'd be like, the pig, with the pigeons eaten off the street sometimes. The jackdaws in particular were doing that. Another place we went to with the family was to uh, go to the other side of the uh, Lake Vatern and then uh, go to some of this, uh, these lakes over here where birds stage and, and uh, are found in migration. One of the places here we went to was uh, this uh, Valcom until Transen. Transen basically translates where the cranes danced. Um, and uh, Helsingborg's Jan. So Jan means land, and so it's 
Hort, Hort, Hortenbach's yawn, so it's Hortenbach's land, nature reserve. And you have a, a white-tailed eagle, you have a, a red kite, you have the cranes, and more cranes in the air here on the picture. So we saw cranes there. Mm -hmm. In the spring, there'll be tens of thousands of cranes doing their mating dance. And I guess that's a goal to go back there again and experience that. Very similar to our sandhill crane. They're about the same size if you measure and weigh them. Um, but you know, white and different coloring than what we expect with the sandhill. We had common buzzards flying by. Um, the common buzzard is a beauty of beauty <coughs> and it's a relation to our, our red-tailed hawk, or Budeo gemesis, I think it's called. <coughs> um, real similar size and shape and just a little darker color and so forth. Red kites were everywhere, it seemed. Uh, having not seen a lot of kites in my life, when you see one, you see two. When you see two, you see three. They're always kind of hunting together, um, I guess, as kites can do. When you're in Sweden, you can't escape uh, castles, like this one in a town called Orebru. And then there's old estate houses, and there's birds there too. We were birding there, as well as looking around. Our hosts were pretty gracious. They showed us all the good birding spots that they had. They insisted I drive their Tesla, which was a good experience. <laughs> and their old Volvo Amazon, which was, uh, you know, old technology, 68 horsepower, 97 uh, foot-pounds of torque, 0 to 60, 14 seconds. <laughs> so, you know, different kind of car. <laughs> Older than I am, so. And that'll conclude the uh, trip that we had with our family. They dropped us down at the end of Malmo. We spent a night there, and... Um, we're met the next morning by the birding group we joined. Malmö is the third largest city in Sweden. It's historically known for its shipyards. But largely those shipyards have turned into residential areas now uh, for res residential boating and residential living. Southern Sweden is pretty flat. It's pretty temperate. It's very similar to the weather you might have in the Netherlands. So a lot of bikes there. Here's a uh, a kid bicycle, taking your kids to school or whatnot. Malmö is also known for a big tower called the, the uh, Turning Torso. It's a big residential building. Um, of very interesting <laughs> engineering. I don't think it's been duplicated. So now we get to the birding trip that we signed on with, which is with wings. We're going to go to the Fausterbu Peninsula, and um, there are two towns here. There's a town called Skanor, which is basically this town up here, and then this whole town here is Fausterbu. And uh, there's a lighthouse here with birding venues uh, out to here, and you can basically bird anywhere along here, but largely you're going to bird here. A lot of this is wetlands. It's somewhat impassable. There are paths that can take you out here and, and maybe out through here. So there's birding up this way along the coast. This is the playground for uh, a lot of the wealthy of Scandinavia or Sweden. The people from Stockholm come down here, have their summer home and, and have their little beach cottage along the beach and enjoy the golf courses and beach uh, life here. This area is full of reeds and wetland. There's no cattails here in Europe. It's just all reeds. Um, there are some birds that live here, but most of this is a migration venue. Not so much a uh, place you'd go to bird in the summer, for example. The, um, there's a Fausterbo Bird Observatory. It's based at the White House, or a house behind the White House, which is about here. And they have banding stations that occur in the reeds roughly in this area, 
and then roughly in this area with uh, burning huts that they do the painting at here and also by the White House. So beginning in July and then until the fall through November, birds from the far north in the tundra, the boreal forests, um, head south and they follow the land mass, uh, preferring not to cross water uh, as, they, as they travel south. And Falsterboo, this peninsula, acts like a very narrow delivery of an enormous funnel. Um, the birds want to get south and they stay on the land and they finally get to the end and they have no place to go but across. In the spring, the birds take a different route. They're following the land. They end up at the tip of Denmark, a little town uh, called Skagen, and then off they go uh, across the uh, Orison Strait and up to Scandinavia, uh, to, to Sweden and Norway above. On the regional level, uh, the birds prefer not to go across the very short passage from Helsingborg to Copenhagen or to Denmark, they don't know the difference. They follow the shoreline until they have no option. And uh, then they jump across, they'll jump across here. The wind they want is a southwest wind, a wind that's coming at them. And then they lift off into the wind when they migrate. So if they have the wrong wind, they hold up in the peninsula. So if you get it right, you may be on a day there where you get all the birds, or you may be on a day there where it's blue sky, and you don't get the birds you want. Right down to the tip. So this is a map of where we birded. Our eBird checklist occurred on the trip. You can see the hot spots we hit in the different areas. Most of the time we're spent uh, on the peninsula, but we did venture forth to some forests and to some uh, other lakes, inland lakes, um, and other venues that were uh, um, inland a bit. This southern Sweden is the bread basket of Sweden. It's where all the grain fields are. You get a little further north from where we were staying with my family, it becomes just impressively wooded um, and not as much farmland at all. So all the rye bread and, and hard bread they make is, is, is down here. Here's our group that was on the bird trip with wings. Um, we're in front of the Foster Blue White House. We have two guides and uh, the participants, seven participants. On the back left is Stefan Menzi, tell our gentleman there. Um, he's a British native who moved to Malmo to run the Faustabro uh, Bird Observatory for several years. He's also the editor right now of British Birds. You can subscribe to British Birds and learn about the happenings uh, uh, in England and, and about Europe as well. Um, he also um, was a producer for the Collins Bird Guide app. So if you download the European app you need to look at birds in Europe and look in the, in the, in the info page about the app, he's one of the producers that made that app happen. So recently produced app and we used it during our trip. On the back right, uh, the gentleman in the back is a young kid, his name is Ben Lucky. And if you're eBird in Michigan, you might have seen his name. He actually lives in Ann Arbor. He's a native of England, but his parents have immigrated to the U.S. and live in the, in the Ann Arbor area. And he's a new hire for wings, so he's there as a, uh, as a young guy to learn how to guide. Um, our uh, hotel room during the stay here was in this uh, building separate from the, uh, the hotel that we were at. Uh, this uh, building has a conference room to the left below. And above are two uh, large uh, bedrooms that they uh, rent out as part of the hotel. Complete with a red stag and an old Husqvarna double shotgun. The room was really uh, spacious, uh, comfortable. Uh, like Linda says she'd stay there again, right? Mm -hmm. This is the hotel uh, swimming pool and, and terrace area. There are rooms that surround this as well as rooms there upstairs um, from this area. 
They have a closed courtyard where they would serve breakfast in the morning. You could sit around anywhere you want here, plus a dining area attached to this. And the typical uh, breakfast was uh, this, this European uh, uh, fair where they served you various cheeses and cut meats and things to put on your bread and, and make, a sa make an open-faced sandwich with. There was fruit and there was a, uh, a, a light English breakfast that they served uh, on some hot plates. Um, but mostly, you know, these fixings with your bread. And the bread was fresh, uh, warm that day for the most part. So after breakfast, we got to get out there and look at birds. This is a wings photo and not really from our trip, but it kind of depicts what good migration looks like. If you time it right, you can have a lot of birds in the air coming at you. The preceding week that we had with my cousins was really pretty cold and wet and rainy unfavorable winds for migration. And I think that held up migration and that we hit it pretty well our first day out there. Here's another photo of what birds can look like in the air. This is not a dirty photo, it's a dark slide, but all those spots in the air are birds that, that are coming at you that you gotta count. So um, again, these birds are flying off the peninsula into that southwest wind and they're happy just taken off like an airplane into the wind. So what's it like birding at the point? Well, that first day for us with the right wind, it's intense migration combined with a sea watch and it's in a marsh. So there's a lot of things to look at and keep your eye on. So here we are set up to uh, watch those birds coming at us. And this is the runway. So the, the north-south sort of edge of that Faustabro Peninsula, the reed marsh and, and the ponds that, that come down and you're watching for the birds that might be coming at you. However, it can be intimidated to really identify these birds and photograph them on the wind. If you don't do it right though, there's a bunch of counters behind you that are doing this professionally, so they're gonna get it right. Mm -hmm. The first morning that we did a, did a watch like this, the far most common bird we had was the common chaffinch. Uh, in, in less than two hours of counting, we had over 46,000 common chaffinches. So there were a lot of birds in the air. The other birds that were really common among the flocks that were coming over were blue tits and the Eurasian siskins, and I'll show you a picture of those later. Common chaffinch was a little easier to identify because it had this pretty bold white wing bar. Um, so once you saw that, you'd say, oh, chaffinch, chaffinch. But our, our young bird guy was, you know, running his clicker and counting the birds as, as the day went on. But you almost have to count for a period of time and then extrapolate. Uh, it's impossible to sort of count that whole mess of birds as they cross in front of you. Here are European goldfinch on the fly. Different, of course, than our goldfinch. Kind of red in the face and a yellow wing bar on a fluffy body. Here's a brambling. And we did see brambling uh, later in the trip, and this is a spotting scope a digiscope pick, but uh, there's a few brambling there in the branches. Here's a woodlark with the two uh, black, white, black, white wing bars and the brown on the back there. This is a, this is a, a Eurasian skylark, kind of a characteristic shape, and uh, we have those in Maui, I figured out. Here's a big crossbill. It's got a huge neck and a stout bill. This is actually a parrot crossbill on the fly. And these bird guides were like calling it out as it was there. And you had to either take a picture or bring your binoculars up and make, make your identification. Here's a great spotted woodpecker. Common snipe. Sort of like our Wilson snipe, but a little different. In addition to looking at the sky, we were looking out over the sea for seabirds. Common golden eye. Common scoter. This is the male, um, and you see it's all black. It's got a little bump on its nose and then a, a flatter orange piece on the on the, on the base of the nose. 
The female is real similar to our black squirt. There were pintails that are pretty ab 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 abundant in the different ponds and flyby situations. Here's the great cormorant, the cormorant you're going to find in the northern Atlantic. <coughs> and there was uh, one species of alcid deer. We had the razor doll. And we had a few of these over the course of the week <coughs> at different venues. And then a bird familiar to home is a herring gull, a European herring gull. And there were lots of cranes, just as high as our cranes call as they fly. Very similar in the, in the feel for that, just a little different song. And more barnacle geese. Ponds and estuaries have a number of waterfall and shore birds. Here's a gadwall, female gadwall. And little grebe, that was a lifer for me. A little smaller than our pied bill grebe. Here's a spotted red shank. You can't really appreciate this bird because in breeding plumage it's like all black. And here it's just a gray looking bird, but that was a pretty uh, cool bird to, to uh, come across. And then common green shake, which is kind of like our greater yellow legs in its song and size and shape and manner. At a distance here, there's a pied avocet. Pied refers to having two colors or more, two or more colors, but in the bird world, in the old bird world, pied usually means it's a black and white bird. So there's a lot of birds that are labeled pied as you, as you bird in Europe and Asia and, 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 and Africa. And they'll be black and white. So again, we don't have cattails here, but we got these reeds, large reed beds. And we're leaving uh, Skanor and walking out to the uh, beach area. As you walk that way, there's some ponds and there's all these little houses, idyllic little houses along the beach there. And these are little beach stugas or beach cottages that the locals have. And they're actually pretty expensive to, to, to buy, the right to have one of these. Um, but, you know, they're advantageous. You've got a place to sit down, have a little table and change your clothes and keep your beach gear and um, they take some pride in them, and they decorate them, and paint them up, and, and keep them right. In the midst of these beach cottages, there's a, a bird ringing shack on the north side here. And they'll work in the reeds and come back and work in the shack. We're kind of waiting to see if they come back with any birds here. So here comes one of the ringers. He's got uh, knee-high or waist-high wet waders on because he's walked out into the water uh, to the nets. He's got uh, bags around his waist that, that hold the birds that he's collected. And he's bringing them back to, uh, to band them and weigh them and look them over. So they take careful notes. You'd think they'd be on computer by now, but they're still doing pen to paper. Put a ring around the leg of the animal. And uh, weigh them in a... <laughs> uh, weigh them on a scale in an old 35 millimeter film tube. I've actually seen that other places too. That's not unique to, to here. And there's of course different uh, size rings for the different birds that you may encounter. And when you're done, you release the bird. So birds in hand, that's kind of fun. Uh, it was really convenient. We got to see these birds up close and snap some cool pictures for memory of what these look like. This was a European robin, which I think is much more endearing than our American robin. Really cute, dark brown eye. And we encountered robins away from the peninsula as well. <coughs> 
Gold crest, a little similar to our golden crown kinglet, but genetically more related to the European fire crest. Real similar to the kinglet. If you didn't know where you were, you might say it's a kinglet, right? Here's a fire crest, a little more bold in its color and um, you know, that really impressive orange stripe on the top of the head. And they're, they're known for this sort of golden neck area here. This is what really makes the bird identified as having this golden band here. And we did encounter the, the uh, fire crest elsewhere during our trip. Uh, we were in a, a dark forest on a, a college campus and came across one. Here's a Eurasian black cap. Here's a common red star, so a European common red star. Start refers to an old English word, stort, stewart, I think it's called, and it means tail, so red tail is where that came from. And here's the, the Eurasian siskins, Mr. and Mrs. here. Kind of look like our pine siskin, I think. Just bolder in the yellow color. How many birds would they stuff in one bag? Typically one per bag. Here's a song thrush. <coughs> very similar to any of the thrushes we have. Here's a dunnock. A sparrow looking bird with a gray head. Common reed warbler. This bird would be native to the reed beds, but then also, you know, elsewhere in the to the north coming down. So I don't know if this is a local bird or if this is a migrant. It's got a big mouth. Uh, these these uh, reed warblers feed on dragonflies and mayflies and, and you know, big, big bugs. Uh, probably the bird with the biggest mouth apart from the raptors that we saw during that trip. For a passerine, that's got a big mouth. Here's a reed bunting. And here's a bird that looks real familiar. It kind of looks like our winter wren. This is the Eurasian wren. Could look like a Pacific wren. I think it's a little lighter in color. But awful cute. You notice this bird's got a little tick. It's got a, it's got a bird tick right here attached to him. And the bird banders, the ringers, were not allowed to remove the ticks. Uh, they had a policy of, you know, let it be, let nature be. Uh, they weren't allowed to assist the bird in any way. Uh, they couldn't, they couldn't help a sick bird. They would have to just release it. It was just the policy of how they do their ringing or banding. But we saw ticks on these banded birds quite often, which I, I didn't know birds got ticks. And we did encounter uh, these Eurasian wrens elsewhere in the trip. This is in a really dark uh, forest. I snapped this blurry picture. Uh, these Eurasian wrens sing like our winter wrens. They uh, are bold for their size on territory, uh, defending what they want to defend. And here's a difficult one. Um, on the left, you have a willow warbler. And the right, you have a common chiff chaff. And I can't tell the difference between the two, except that they told me they were different when they identified them when they banded them. <coughs> but they're actually cousins, but they have different songs, they have different habitats that they uh, eat in and breed in, but they look identical. So birding in Europe isn't always easy. Finger moth, so finger food. Linda's finger food, so that's good for a photo with my wife, Linda. This was uh, a spot we had a couple times, and it's known for its smash burgers, which were pretty good. 
All these passerines that we saw, there's got to be some raptors, right? Following these passerines around in migration are these raptors, and the most common one was this sparrowhawk. And here's one in hand. Real similar in uh, size and shape to uh, a small cooper or a big uh, sharpie. They're also, um, you know, cousins there of, the, of our cooper hawk. But a pretty, a pretty bird in flight. This is a Eurasian hobby. And we were twice surprised by this bird. They would seemingly come out of nowhere, fly at tremendous speed with really strong wing beats. It's a little bigger than a kestrel. It's smaller than a peregrine. It is faster than a merlin. It, it was just impressive how this black bird would suddenly appear and leave in just a moment. And apparently these birds will catch birds in flight and eat them as they continue to fly. So uh, I was impressed with this bird as it, as it came by. You saw a common buzzard earlier I showed. This is another common buzzard, a little darker morph. Uh, real stout bird uh, related to our uh, red-tailed hawk. Beautio. And that's different than the European honey buzzard, which um, has a longer wing, longer tail, and kind of a thinner neck as it, as it comes forward there. We saw three species of harrier on this trip, and on the peninsula in particular. This is a hen harrier, which is very much like our northern harrier. It's got the white band at the base of the tail, has this dihedral flight, or, or beast-like flight, as the birds hover and move around. Um, this is a female. The, the, the male would be gray, almost identical to our northern harrier. And characteristic of this uh, Hen Harrier, they have five uh, uh, terminal uh, wings that you, see, you can count in flight there after you take your picture. And here's another one. Again, one, two, three, four, five fingers on the wing there. We saw earlier that's Marsh Harrier in the field. This is another female Marsh Harrier. Uh, kind of a bulkier wing, heavier bird in its flight and, and appearance. And the female has that uh, yellow creamy cap. The more rare harrier was this pallet harrier. And it was the one that uh, was sort of the trophy or the, the score for the day. Um, it's a, lead, a, a lighter, leaner looking harrier, more agile than the other ones. Uh, we saw a, a couple as they uh, flew over us um, in one afternoon there. Uh, so the rare bird got more photos. But you can see the wings are longer and, and, and just narrower in, in, in their appearance. And it was really agile as it was pestered by a, a, a crow or dock or something. The red kites were plentiful, um, often in groups. Real colorful bird, pointed tail, this rusty shoulder. And we had some black kites, which was really special. I think we had three one afternoon. Hard to track, they were in distance. And not a raptor, but still a bird eater. Here is a great uh, gray shrike. Uh, any shrike you see is a cool shrike. So, more shrikes. How about dinner? We ate at a pretty fancy restaurant for three evenings and one lunch. And uh, <coughs> these are their Swedish meatballs with uh, not jam, but fresh lingen and uh, potatoes. It just ruined IKEA meatballs for me. It was just that good. <laughs> or we had beef short rib with roasted potatoes and root vegetables. That was pretty good as well. It's a pretty soft birding trip. I've been on birding trips where you, where you don't get good food like this, and this was a pretty soft trip. 
this is a church right next to our hotel, uh, lit up at night. And we did do some night birding. We went out and found an owl. Here we have a towny, towny owl. This is real similar to our um, barred owl and uh, was called in by the young guide one evening in a cemetery. So uh, we were pretty happy with that, with that find. Towards the end of the trip, and Linda's still smiling, so I'm doing okay. Uh, she gets the front seat today, by the way, so that's why I got the picture. We went off to a, uh, a, a horse stable place. Here's one of these uh, Renault trucks. It's a horse van. They don't use trailers like we do in the States. They have speed laws where you're pulling trailers, so if you have a horse, you put it in a, trail, in a truck, you can drive faster, it's safer, whatever. So that's why they run these. Horse RVs, if you will. <laughs> this was a sprawling facility with numerous barns um, and stalls and indoor and outdoor arenas. There was an active event going on as we found our way to uh, around these buildings. And I'm thinking, what, what birds are we going to see here? It's a big place, you know. And uh, sure enough, here on the top of these roofs are some big uh, platforms. With the library will be closing in 30 minutes. All public computers will be shutting down in 15 minutes. Thank big, you. Big platforms with wooden, wooden nests going on. Okay, maybe we'll find a bird here. And sure enough, here's a white stork. So apparently there's a population of white storks that uh, is nurtured here. Uh, they band every one of them. They follow each nest. And uh, you can get your life of stork uh, at this venue. These are pretty gangly birds, very prehistoric in their manners, just not, not graceful at all. Uh, but they've got all kinds of jewelry on them, as you can see, they've been banded up. And there's quite a few, as well as a rook flying over the top here. Nearby woods produced a, uh, a lesser spotted woodpecker that some of us saw kind of akin to our uh, downy or hairy woodpecker for size. The European nuthatch, and uh, it behaves pretty much like our nuthatches. And the Eurasian tree creeper, just like our brown creeper, works up the tree, comes to the next tree, starts up again. In, in many of the woodlots and even farm fields, there were common wood pigeons. They were pretty plentiful. Kind of like a really big dove, common wood pigeon. I'm gonna finish with this. Uh, mm -hmm. Have any of you seen this t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Strictly in a bird sense, of course. Um, we saw all these birds on our trip, except the willow tit in the right corner. So we'll work through some of these birds here. Here we have the Eurasian blue tip in hand, bandit. And the ringers, we talked to them about the birds and what they handled. They said, if there's any birds you handle, if you handle these blue tits, you're guaranteed to have a, a sore or a wound on your finger at the end of the day when they band a lot of them. Because this is the most aggressive bird in hand. Uh, it just wants to peck at things and be angry where the other ones seem to settle down and sort of look around and put up with the situation. And we encountered them both at my cousin's house and elsewhere along the trip, so the blue tip. We also had the marsh tip, a real handsome bird, kind of like a fair chickadee. And the crested tip, I'm, I'm pretty partial to the crested tip. That's a pretty nice looking bird. But I think the one that everybody loves is the uh, long tail tip, which is an adorable mousy looking bird with a tiny beak, long tail. It'll weave a, a nest of grasses um, and enter it from the side to, to breed a, uh, a nest in the, in, in the trees here in the spring. Just an adorable looking bird. And 
and then a larger um, tip, the black tip. But essentially they're all chickadee-like birds that flit around the bush quicker than you can get a picture of them. Black tip, or crested tip, or black tip, you know, gray tip. And here's the coal tip, which looks I think, most like our chickadee, maybe with some tweed. Coal tip. And probably the most popular one was the bearded tip, or bearded reedling, a bird that lives in the reeds along the lakes. And that one really got the cameras, camera guys fired up um, as we saw that bird. And I'm going to end with that picture. So that's a sampling of the birds we saw. Two weeks gave me about 146 birds for Sweden, 18 for Denmark, um, and 74 of those were lifers. So I think wow. uh, as an introduction for me to Scandinavia, that worked out pretty good. Um, and uh, Linda had a good time too. So that's what really matters. So, <laughs> so good. Thank you very much. You, you said it was fall. What were the dates, really? Just we were the last uh, two weeks of September. Okay. We were wearing long underwear on some days, and other days it was t-shirt weather. Um, when it was windy and rainy, we were in the high 40s, low 50s. Yeah. We have lapwings there in Sweden. Yeah, we encountered lapwings. I didn't have any great pictures of them. Uh, there were some uh, pond and estuary kind of places where we had lapwings. There were a number of shorebirds. Beside the um, godwit I showed you, we had uh, the bar-tailed godwit as well. So we, we, we had both godwits. Um, um, we had a red knot, but again, in distance where I didn't get a great photo. Do a lot of the birds like the red knot in a lot of those birds? Kind of share North America and Europe. Do they kind of like have different subspecies for each? Do they like look different? Do you look at them and it's like, oh, that looks weird? I can't tell them apart. So if you see a Dunlin in, in Iceland or a Dunlin in uh, um, Sweden or a Dunlin in Holland, Michigan, I don't think I can tell the difference. But there seems to be, you know, as you saw the, the path for the migration there for the, uh, the godwit that I showed you. There are species that will be anywhere up in the northern latitude and then may favor a location to the south, but there's other ones that are further east that are going further south or, you know, just different areas. Um, we always wonder why do we see um, a rough here in, in the U.S. I think they're vagrants, but, but some species start in Alaska and end up, I don't know, South America or something. Another question. I didn't catch what, what is that last bird? So this is a uh, bearded tip or bearded reedling. So one of one of the one of the tips. Yeah. Yeah. Now they, they don't classify them as other tips anymore. They, what's that? They don't classify them as bird. They don't. Yeah. So it's still on the t-shirt. On the t-shirt. The next trip is Finland, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure after that, mm -hmm. but this spring hopefully. Mm -hmm. I have more birds in, in Scandinavia I want to see. I think the fun thing is to see new things, and I want to see more. Mm -hmm. So, do you, are you going to see different kind of birds in Finland and different birds in the spring than you do in the fall? Um, there's a chance at some new birds, and mainly the grouse that I want to see, the European grouse. So there's a four or five grouse in, in Scandinavia that you can see. Now some I might have seen already being to Iceland and, and to, to Alaska, but there'll be other ones that are, and there's some owls that I might see and pick up as well. But it, it isn't just about the numbers, because if you want numbers, you can go on some trip to South America and crank out 400 birds in a, in a quick trip. But it's about, it's, for me, it's about seeing Scandinavia, where I've traveled, 
in a different way. Mm. And and sort of being semi-proficient with it, you know? And then maybe move on to the next thing. Um, so it, it, for me, birding is about seeing something new. It's like every new bird is, is like Christmas, a new Christmas present. <laughs> uh, the, the, moment of, the moment of discovery, the element of surprise, to me, that's what I enjoy about birding. So uh, repeating old stuff is good, um, but, but seeing new stuff is, is good too. Any other questions? Let's thank Eric again. Thank you, Eric.